I think the United Nations doesn't even see the United States as a major player in the future government of the world. In fact, I, I think the UN's plan is ultimately for the United States to shatter and be balkanized. And you are right. Yeah. You are right. And so, hey, thank you, Mike, but you, what you just said is true. They don't even care about the United States. I even think they're going to give up Israel. And, and when that happens, I don't know who we're going to start blaming. You know, maybe we'll find the, the, the true culprits one day. One day. All thank right. you, Mike. And I'll so thank you for letting me speak. All right, you got it. Thanks a lot for the phone call. I do not think the United Nations will abandon Israel because Israel has subverted the United Nations to the same extent they've subverted the U.S. government, the British government, the German government, the French government, on and on and on and on. In fact, I am convinced that Bibi Netanyahu sees himself as ruler of the world, especially if they can get the, uh, the dumb Americans and the dumb Russians to nuke each other off the face of the planet. That will leave Israel with their nuclear weapons basically telling everybody else what to do. All righty. Now, moving on to the situation with Syria. The Obama administration is moving to increase military aid to the Syrian opposition. They're still using that word opposition like they're dealing with a legitimate public uh, revolution uh, against Assad's government. And yet they're continuously uh, the Syrian government is capturing all these foreign troops, French troops, American troops on the ground. Now it's basically come out that Mossad and Blackwater as a private intelligence agency and the CIA are leading the operations in Homs. They're involved in all that violence that's over there. They're, it's basically, it's all manufactured violence in order to justify a takeover of the place. Uh, one of the emails that came out from the Stratford data dump basically involves an admission by the Pentagon that they planned to direct these terror attacks inside Syria in order to create the illusion of a popular violent uprising against President Bashar al-Assad. This has become the American standard means of operating. Go into a country with a bunch of money and a bunch of saboteurs and a bunch of agent provocateurs, create the illusion of a popular uprising, cause a lot of violence, then the U.S. says, oh, we must help the uprising. It's an expression of democracy against a tyrant. And then they overthrow the government and they put in another U.S. puppet. This is what they did back in 1953 in Iran. You had the democratically elected government of Mohammad Mossadegh, and he nationalized Iran's oil and said, if you want our oil, you will pay full market price for it. Well, this didn't sit well with either Britain or the United States of America. So the CIA goes in, they cause a lot of trouble, and they say, oh, there's a popular revolution against uh, Mossadegh, and basically overthrow him, and they impose the Shah, who brought with him the Savak, and simply oppressed the people of Iran from 1953 to 1979, when the Iranian people said, we've had enough of this crud, and they kicked out the Shah, and they didn't like the United States from that point on, and one can hardly blame them. And the United States knows how to carry a grudge. They've been carrying one against Cuba for all these decades. And the U.S. government's attitude is you do not throw out our imposed puppet rulers. You do not free yourselves from our covert control. That just is not allowed to stand. So the United States got Iraq to invade Iran to try and reconquer it that way. That didn't work out. Saddam lost that war. So now they're trying to basically find another way to go in there and re-enslave the Iranian people and get their oil for pennies on the dollar. And that's what it's really all about. It's like I said, the core issue for all of these problems, all this misery, is that model of a private central bank issuing a debt-based currency, which by design causes more debt than money. doesn't matter how hard you work or how much you sacrifice, you cannot get out of debt. Until finally the nation reaches a point where conquest and invasion of other countries to loot their wealth is the only way to keep the scam moving forward. And that's why I've, I keep saying, and I, I'll keep on repeating this, prior to the invention of the Federal Reserve System, there was no such thing as a world war. It is an artifact of this Ponzi scheme, this pyramid financial system. And as I told that other caller, it makes about as much sense to put bankers in charge of our national economy as it does to put drug addicts in charge of our medical system. After a while, anything of any real value or utility is in private pockets, and the nation is trying to get by with nothing but placebos. That's what a Federal Reserve note is. It's a placebo currency. 
Anyway, now interesting video has come out. Uh, you may have heard the name Syria Danny. This is one of these Syrian refugees, the poor people of Syria being abused that CNN has kind of been waving around at everybody. Somebody leaked a video in which they show this Syria Danny and the producers of the video segments actually orchestrating when the gunfire is going to come in in order to create the proper appearance that Syria is in turmoil and it needs the American people to come on in and save them from their evil elected government. We're going to take a break. We'll be back after these words from our sponsors. Out there, and again, one of the amazing things is how often they will keep repeating the same stuff all over again. Uh, Apparently, uh, Marine General James Matisse, head of the U.S. Central Command, is now out there saying, Syria! has weapons of mass destruction. They have chemical weapons. They have biological weapons. We heard the same thing going into Iraq. They never found anything. They found some leftover corroded shells that were designed to carry chemical weapons that the U.S. had given Iraq when Iraq was being our little obedient uh, proxy uh, army invading Iran. But the shells had never been used. They'd never been filled with chemical weapons. They just sat in the in the yard until they rusted away and they tried to make a big deal about that we found chemical weapon shells any chemical weapons in them no but we found the shells are they usable Nah, they're rusted solid well you know it's not a big deal so now this general matisse is out there basically we're playing the same thing with syria they have chemical and biological weapons and maybe they do and maybe they don't but you know something it's not our problem syria is not going to attack the united states of america so it's not an issue in fact let's be honest Given that the United States has got the world's largest nuclear arsenal, what nation on earth is actually a danger or threat to us? None. In fact, if you go back to the policy papers of the Project for the New American Century, the real agenda is we got the biggest bat, let's use it. And that's what's happening. We're going to take a break for commercials. We'll be right back. So anyway, uh, we're, we're seeing all these stories about now Syria has biological weapons, and it's the same game all over again just like this the situation with oh they've got nuclear weapons we've got to destroy them and we've heard it before in 1961 when israel bombed iraq's civilian power station and we heard it again in 2003 when iraq was invaded and destroyed and they lynched saddam hussein and said huzzah huzzah we're in there and there were no weapons of mass destruction nuclear or otherwise and now they're saying it again about syria and iran how many times do you have to be lied to before you will stand up and say, you are all liars in the corporate media and the state house and the pulpit. And I don't want to live in a world ruled by lies any longer. I want the truth. I want a truthful government or I will have no government at all. I will not be ruled by lies. Because when you're, ru- you're ruled by lies, you don't know what's going on. You can't. The Declaration of Independence reminds us all that in a mature republic, governments rule with the consent of the governed. I don't know anybody who consents to be lied to. The government is not legally allowed to lie to you. And the Tenth Amendment prohibits them from simply assuming that. No court in this land would enforce a contract where one party says, I agree to be lied to by the other party. Because you cannot know what you are agreeing to which is the fundamental basis of contract law. We, the people, have a contract with the government. It's called the Constitution. And people who are lying while under contract are subject to legal action. I, am, I hold absolutely that when government lies to the people, it acts unconstitutionally and illegally, and it ceases to be the legitimate government of this land. I take offense at these recent court decisions that say intentional deliberate lies by politicians are protected speech under the first amendment i take exception to the court decision that said media corporations uh, have a legal right to tell their reporters to lie to you and when they refuse they can be fired legitimately that court decision all by itself in the fox news synthetic bovine growth hormone lawsuit tells you that the corporate media is paid to lie to you. Which, of course, is why you're here listening to RBN today. George in Texas. Aloha, George. Welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Uh, how you doing, Mike? Uh, 
I got a possible breaking story. Um, I'm trying to get some more uh, confirmation. It happened during a Russian election. Mm-hmm. And I have a feeling this is a George Soros stunt because uh, Vladimir Putin won with such overwhelming margin. I don't think he needed to cheat. Yeah. You know. And here's the thing: is they had uh, they had people on camera sitting there offering to pay 500 rubles if they go vote for Putin. Mm-hmm. A bunch of these young kids and all that stuff. I said, that sounds like a George Soros thing. It sounds like a CIA yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, because uh, Israel does not want Putin uh, in the presidency, neither does the, the United States, because he stands up to them. When Putin was president before, he kicked out the oligarchs and paid off Russia's national debt in something like three years. Just insane. And he will not back down from American and Israeli expansionism. And it's kind of almost, if it wasn't such a serious subject, it would almost be laughable to watch the same American media that insists, you know, eight counties of missing votes or eight precincts of missing votes in Iowa is just an honest mistake, then turn around and scream vote fraud, vote fraud uh, in, in, in Russia. You know, and what is really scary is every time they start screaming vote fraud, he's not the real leader. That signals that our U.S. government may be stupid enough, maybe reckless enough to try and send in infiltrators to start disrupting the Russian society, causing turmoil there, so they can say, aha, there's a new Russian revolution, we must support it, we must fund it, we must give them weapons, and then we really will be in an all-out nuclear world war. Well, another thing, too, is I know someone, even during the, even during the Russian election, when they counted the votes, it was counted out in the open, mm-hmm. paper ballots. I mean, out in the open, paper ballot, even a ballot box was plexiglass so everybody can see it. That's the way it should be done here. And you know what's amazing? Even during uh, yesterday's Super Tuesday, CNN, every time they showed a video of, uh, of ballots being counted by hand in the open, Ron Paul was way in the lead. It's all in these secret rooms, computers, back things. The U.S. has no grounds to talk about vote honesty in any other country at this point. George, got to let you go. Got to take a break for commercials. We'll be right back. And aloha, America. Welcome back to the show here. We're going to go back to the phones. Robin in Toronto. What's the difference between Canada and the Soviet Union? Then? They're both socialist countries. Well, so, socialism gets, gets bandied around quite a bit, and I think it's a question of degree rather than absolutes. There are... Well, s- bandying it around, too. Well, the, it. there are... Socialism. I don't what? live in a communist country. Uh, I just like the difference between Russian socialism and Canadian socialism. Well, I'm not as well schooled in Russian socialism as I am in the Canadian socialism. There are parts of socialism that actually do work, but I think in the long run, uh, I, I, I think the fate of the Soviet Union uh, showed that, that communism, or rather socialism, uh, has some inherent weaknesses, if for no other reason than it disincentivizes individual human achievement. And I, I think we need to recognize socialism would work if every human being was a walking saint. But we do need to find ways to motivate people to achievement. And that's very, very hard to come by under socialism. I know they were really big at handing out medals and, and decorations and stuff. But that's kind of an abstraction. And I, I think capitalism worked a lot better back when people could work and then expect to accrue the rewards from that work. But starting in 1913, slowly the people who are at, whose labor produces the wealth are not allowed to keep that wealth any longer. And that's what I mean by having gone over to this fascist economic state. And it's no secret the United States is a fascist government. Those ornaments on the front of the House of Representatives, those are, uh, you know, those are a fascist emblem. And we know that quite a few people within our government espouse ideas that represent a fascist state of affairs. Most recently, this tendency to forgive corporations for any malfeasance that they commit and then turn around and loot the people to pay for the losses. That is absolute fascism. Now, Canada, up until it started uh, being compromised by uh, Israel's influence, uh, seemed to be working. And we know there are socialist societies that actually do seem to work very well because they have governments that remember they're there to take care of the people. But socialism can become corrupted, just like capitalism. Uh, We certainly saw that to the latter days of the old Soviet Union. And again, the old Soviet Union, part of the reason for their collapse was the oligarchs. And that's why when the new Russian Republic was created, the first thing Putin did is, let's get rid of the money junkies. 
and then things even out for everybody. Because when you have a banking system that is in the clutch of the money junkies, it's they're there to make themselves richer, and they don't care about the people. And that's why I'm, I think I'm going to make up a T-shirt out of this whole situation. Having bankers in charge of our nation's economy is like having drug addicts in charge of our hospitals. And it really, it, it's kind of in the same situation. So anyway, uh, Canada, Canada, I think overall uh, has some very positive things about it. I've been to Canada many times. I've been to Toronto many times, uh, and I really liked it. It's very clean up there. People are still very proud of their country up there. But I'm seeing Canada head into the same decline that the United States is because Canada will not learn from the same mistake, the mistakes that we made down here.